You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the most exciting free internet television show about global trade of the world. Global Trade This Week. I'm Pete Mento, and with me, as always, is my, uh, my wingman, my partner in all things global trade, Doug Draper. How are you, Doug? Pete, I'm doing well. I am doing That's well post, post Labor Day, enjoying the heat still, but Ugh. other than that, very well. Yeah. I, I had a pretty quiet Labor Day. It rained like hell here yesterday. It continues to. Um, it was in the 40s last night. So if that's any indication, it's going to be a pretty miserable fall, buddy. Mm. Um, but I don't mind. I always say I, I don't like the heat. So I'm, I'm okay with it cooling down, buddy. But yeah. uh, enough of the old man weather talk. It's this week, Global Trade This Week, brought to you by our good friends at Cap Logistics. And Doug, because I kicked the show off, that means you get to give your first topic, pal. So why don't you go ahead and ring it in? All right. Well, this one is not very creative, uh, but it's important to let our audience know that Pete and I got your back. And as Pete mentioned at the first of the show is that um, free is the key word. So the information, the stories and the predictions that we make on this show, we always talk about being forward thinking is real. So go ahead and plan your budgets and uh, everything you need to do in your supply chain around these yeah. comments. So. It, Pete, seriously, I was thinking about this. I'm like, what can I talk about for today? And I'm like, you know what? It's important to rewind and reset for our audience some of the predictions that we made, not necessarily on our project prediction show, although one of them is, uh, but things that we've talked about time and time again. Um, the first one was a headline that said, hey, there's only eight ships off the coast of L.A., but there's 45 or 41 ships off the coast of Savannah. And I started thinking um, that, yeah, because we, you and I, have been talking about when congestion got heavy in L.A., people found second tier ports uh, to be a priority. So the simple fact that L.A. is waning and the second tier ports like Savannah uh, and Norfolk are growing. And oh, by the way, there's congestion out there. Yeah, that's what we talked about. We said people are going to um, take their freight around the horn, so to speak, and through the Panama Canal. And so, yeah, they're going to be congested. So here's the forward take on this one, Pete. When the freight gets off the boat, it has to go somewhere. So warehouses are going to get congested uh, and people have to work in the warehouses. So they're going to be challenged to find uh, workers. And so, um, employment, unemployment is going to go dramatically down. And you got to send in trucks to pick all this product up that's off the ships now in the warehouses. So there's going to be congestion. So if you are a logistician out there and your solution to the guys in the C level was C meaning C, CFO, COO, is to bring things around uh, to smaller ports. Bravo to you. We talked about that earlier, but now there's going to be congestion in those markets. And then you're going to hear chirping about people talking about too much congestion, too much of this, too much of that, kind of like the get off my yard guys. So I thought that was important because that headline in and of itself on August 30th validates it. The second thing we talked about, Pete, is that um, the big boys are going to start uh, owning the rails and acquisitions in 2022 are going to be off the charts. And um, we could go back and look at all of the different companies that um, major asset providers have acquired. But the latest one was on the 31st of August. Maersk is adding LF logistics, e-commerce, contract warehousing, inland transportation, and it's just adding to their supply chain portfolio. So we've talked about how owning the rails gives you control. Um, and this is another example of a steamship line jumping into warehousing. You know, rewind pre-pandemic, Pete, that never would have happened. And you and I spoke about it months ago. So the one thing I want to give you absolute kudos for is that in our prediction show in 2022, it was December of 21, you specifically said by the end of the quarter, Russia was going to invade Ukraine. And it, it happened. And I was just, I think about that. And I'm like, that is an amazing prediction based on uh, your incredible knowledge 
of global trade and, and how things operate. So anyway, it's not a um, forward leaning topic, which we talk about. It's more looking in the past, but it's important for audience to know is that the gibberish and the things we talk about is not just stuff that we threw off the top of our hat. It's through in-depth analysis and research and pay attention to the things that we're talking about. We got your back, people. We got your back. Yeah, uh, uh, Doug, you bring up a lot of great points there. Um, you know, the Ukraine thing is something I, uh, it's, it, for people who don't know, Doug, our, our first real big interaction online, the one that we like to harken back to was you and I did a podcast in January of, was it 19? Where we talked about COVID? Oh, uh, that was, jeez. Uh, yeah, it was before COVID. So that would have been like gee, February of 2020. It was early, super early. And it, um, and then we just, we said no one's really thinking about the fact that a serious pandemic could really affect logistics. This is beginning to spread significantly. Has anyone thought about if it takes that next step, what it could mean globally? We didn't say the whole world's going to shut down. We didn't, you know, we didn't take that next step, but we just said, has anybody bothered to think about what happens if this thing takes the next step? Because it looks like it could. Not saying it's going to, but no one has really bothered to think about what could happen next. And we got roasted. Like, I don't know about you, man, but I took a lot of shit for it, Doug. Hmm. And then that just made me double down because I'm, you know, I'm that guy. And I said, okay, well, fine. You guys want to act that way? Here you go. No one seems to have a resilient supply chain. Everyone is buying from one place. Blank percentage of the supply chain is coming from here to here. You know, roughly 49% of ocean going containers are going from this port to these ports, you know, meaning from Asia to the West Coast of the United States. Like I just, I just tore people's backsides out online and I said, we'll see what happens if this continues. And then I think it was maybe 14, 15 days later that the number started going like this. And I said, oh, well, now, now let's see what's going on. And then I turned into that guy where I said, maybe we were onto something. And that's when you and I had this conversation that we should start considering a show where we don't talk about what is happening, but what might happen. Mm -hmm. And did we have, did we have the, the bravery, I suppose, to really put it all on the line? And that's what the show's always been about. So I hate the fact that what people mostly remember us for is talking about a pandemic and how it affected supply chain before it did, talking about how the global supply chain pretty much collapsed and talking about it before it did talking about how global supply chain rates went absolutely bonkers before they did, and it did. Talking about how congestion wrecked retail before it did, and it did. And then me last year in, in December, just boldly saying like a jackass, yeah, Putin's going to invade the Ukraine. Here's how it's going to happen. Here's where it's going to happen. And here's what it's going to mean for global energy prices. And then, you know, recently I've been saying that, it, you know, financially it was going to be a boon for Russia and here's why. And and I was right. And um, I hate that it seems that the stuff that we're right about is always this doom and gloom crap. Stuff. Like, <laughs> I want to be right about some positive stuff. So I'm kind of trying to focus on finding something about that. I haven't yet. But um, yeah, you know, we've, we've, um, and you know, what you just talked about though is, is kind of where I want to take this next one. You've been bringing up a lot about the connectors and supply chain, the connectors and logistics, and how this is where this is the meat and the stew. This is the most important part of, of what the, where the recovery in our industry is going to come from. You can do, we, can, we can argue and complain whatever we want about ocean carriers. There are only so many, I mean, what is it, eight of them control just about the entire market. And we can, we can whine and whinge all we want. They're going to do what they want to do. Uh, they, they went on a buying spree and they bought a lot of companies in order to solidify their place in the industry. You got a lot of cash, you can do that. I think the next the next big shoe to drop, pal, is that buyer's remorse. It's going to be the next 36 months when they look back at these massive investments and say, and, you, and Doug, I'm going to give them the benefit of a doubt. And I'm going to say that many of them did this knowing that there was going to be some shedding that was going to need to happen, that they probably overbought knowing that they were going to have to overinvest and then this was the time to overinvest when they could. Okay. And over the next 36 months, they're going to have to shed some things as their strategy and their forward thinking gets a little, 
a little better. Uh, two things are going to happen. They're going to begin to refine their decisions. The second thing is they're going to shed a lot of these ideas that they had when they realized that they've, they've just simply gotten bigger and overinvested in places that they shouldn't have. The good news for the rest of the industry is there's going to be some, some incredible buys. So if I were a $1 to $2 billion logistics company, and now there's a lot of those out there. It wasn't all that long ago that there weren't any. But if I were one of those companies and I had that money sitting in reserve, I would be waiting for that you know, mid-tier e-commerce company, that freight brokerage, that, um, that software firm that got gobbled up by a ocean carrier, that they're just going to decide, we're going to go with choice A because we bought A, B, and C. So we're going to go to B and C and put them out in the marketplace. And there's going to be some bargain basement purchases of companies that are still being developed, still having money thrown into them. They're just not going to be part of the portfolio anymore. And, you know, whatever, Pete and Doug's Forwarding Incorporated is going to be able to go out there and pick them up for a song because they're just not going to be as valuable anymore in a down market. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man, I think it's going to happen. But being bold and, and making predictions means we're also wrong sometimes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. We have been wrong sometimes, but, you know, man in the arena, at least we're willing to go out there and try to do it. But yeah, I love it. It's a good take. All right, buddy. Throw yeah. it. Throw it to you. Yeah. For, um, first, first topic is, is a, is an ugly one. Um, we talk about rail a lot. I've been, I've been thinking about that, you know, probably the course of the next, of the last 12 weeks, 16 weeks, I bet at least a quarter of the time rail comes up. And it, it comes up a lot because it's, it's, become, it's become a really troublesome topic in our industry. I was uh, at a meeting last week where I was discussing with, how, with, with some executives about how there's, there's, there's almost warehousing as a service where people are looking for slow ships because they'd rather have their inventory on the way in a very slow environment, but they know it's on the way. And maybe instead of taking four to eight weeks, it's taken like 16 because it's stopping in every single place along the way, but it's not in their warehouse and it's not stuck on the rail, you know, and how some people are putting their stuff on the rail, knowing it's going to take forever because they need to get space opened up in their warehouse. But at least if it's still in transit mm -hmm. and it hasn't made it to their door, they don't need to worry about taking it in as inventory for their books. I'm like, that's pretty smart. You know? But that leads to a real problem in, in that we're not using the rail for what it's meant to be used for, which is that all important inbound connector to the middle of the country and from the middle of the country outbound. This, the rail system is it's critical infrastructure for our country's chemicals, agriculture, um, heavy industry agriculture is livestock to get things out of the middle of the country to the outside so it could be exported. And then mm -hmm. for parts of it, like fertilizer and the such into the middle of the country, steel, taconite, those sorts of things to be used in production. And right now it's just inundated and overrun with things that it wasn't really meant for. And it's raising the cost and raising congestion for the people who desperately, desperately need it. And they can't get a hold of it, Doug, and they can't use it. And it's becoming a real problem a real serious problem. And I think if, if we could get someone with some power to take a look at this, um, they, could, they could probably see that there's better ways to manage this and handle it. Give you a great example. We're living in a time when there are so many alternate ways to manage this problem. One of the best being transloading. So many companies now can take a container off of a ship, bring it to a transloading uh, facility, take it out of your 40, put it on a 53 foot uh, trailer and then deliver it wherever. Hell, they'll bring it to Canada for you. Cross the border, you know, make a make an entry at the border and bring it to your facility. And then you can get that container wherever it needs to be within the same day in some instances, rather than having to worry about demerge, detention, and all those other problems that come along with it. Why wouldn't you do that instead of putting it on the rail and having to worry about what happens next over the course of who knows how long? It just seems like a much smarter way to deal with it. Is it a question of our industry just not knowing that there are better ways to do it? Or is it just a, an intentional decision that's being made because it's a cheap and convenient way 
to use these, this connector in a way that it wasn't meant to be done, Doug. Um, mm -hmm. One way or the other, it's screwing farmers. And if there's one thing this show has talked a lot about, it's two boys that grew up in farming communities that hate farmers getting screwed with. <laughs> so, uh, I don't like it, bud. Yeah. Yeah, the rail's an interesting animal. I've um, leaned on the, the post office a little bit um, for lack of being able to pivot. And I think the rail... I don't know, man. I was I was hyping it because the rail has so many advantages, especially with uh, carbon neutral and and the marketing ability to talk about how they can move product from A to B with minimal yeah. impact uh, and the ca carbon neutrality and all the things that we're looking on with global warming. That um, I I was hyped about it, like get out there and promote it and go go go. But the rail's the rail, man. It's going to move at the speed in which it moves, and um, you could try to turn it. And it's going to move really slow. You've seen some of the acquisitions that have come up um, recently and that, that we've talked about. And I just don't, I don't know. I like both your points. One, rolling warehouses, you got to be pretty smart uh, and on your supply chain game to understand how that works because there are people that do it. Um, because if you're just willy nilly, you're, you're going to be in a really bad spot. But if uh, you have a pretty robust supply chain and got some smart people, that is certainly is an option. Um, but it, it's just, I want the rail to do more, but, um, I, with you, people probably look at it and say, what's the cost benefit? And they're like, Jesus, I just need to get my stuff off the freaking boat and off the train so I can have control because once it goes on the rail, it does what it does. And you see it when you see it and, and that's it. Sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's bad, but I don't know. There's, I still think that there's a heck of an opportunity uh, to pivot and, and talk about the carbon neutrality and all the things uh, that the rail brings to the table, if they can market appropriately. But it is what it is, and uh, it's going to move at the speed in which it moves. And so I don't know if there's an answer. I don't know what my comment is specifically to yours, Pete, but the rail is an interesting animal. And um, it, it, uh, it it's going to be, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, every single mode of transportation has become more important. Uh, over the course of this pandemic and our recovery. And I think that rail has really, really gotten itself, re-entrenched re, re itself. And it's done it, done it in a way that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. You know, they haven't, they haven't gone out there and lit the world on fire. But what they have done is they've, they've just reinstated just how incredibly important they are. And I think that uh, over the next 10 years, we're going to see a reinvestment in that particular, for all the things you just said, carbon neutral, great for the environment, moves a lot, a little bit of money. And it's mm -hmm. something the federal government can do something about. They really can. They can get involved. They can invest in it. They can put money in it. They can make it better. So I do think you're going to see that as a, as a mode of transportation. It's going to get a lot more investment and it's going to just continue to become more and more important. Yeah. 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 All right. This brings us to the halftime of our show. Um, obviously, it's brought by Cap Logistics. They uh, enable us and allow us to pontificate every week about our forward-leaning uh, views with the supply chain. Visit caplogistics.com when you get a chance. So my favorite part of the show, Pete, halftime. Um, fire away. I have zero idea what you're going to talk about. So, so just rip it. Yeah, bud. So um, my halftime is a fun one. I, um, I don't do the social media much anymore. There was a time when I loved doing it, but not so much anymore. And when I was a young man, I loved back to school. And there was a bunch of reasons for it. One, when I was a, when I was a wee little trade nerd, I loved getting my new lunchbox every year. I thought that was great, oh, yeah. you know? Um, and then also I loved going out and doing, um, my back to school shopping for my clothes, particularly when I got older and I got to pick what I wanted to wear. Um, my youngest, you know, my, my 16 year old daughter is not really into clothes. So it's not such a big deal to her, but you know, back to school, it was, it was wonderful, man. I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I had some regrettable fashion decisions because I went to high school in the 1980s, my friend. And um, I was a bit of a uh, punk rocker, kind of new wavy, 
guy, mm-hmm. which should come as no surprise, I suppose. Um, and I wanted to know, Doug, so for, for my senior year, I went to a Catholic school. So during school days, there was one way Pete meant to address. And then when I wasn't in school, there was an entirely different. But when I went to school, you know, it was um, it was khakis with the polo, with the with the collar up. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, and I had my head was shaved all around the outside. But on top, it was all puffy on top. I had big curly hair. I had my earring. Um, there may have been some makeup from time to time. I was crazy like that. Uh, Two different colored Chuck Taylors. Maybe one was turquoise and one was red or blue. Who knows? Two different swatch watches. Yes, there Um, you go. I was going to ask you how many swatches you had. Yeah, two different swatch watches. One set to London time, you know, because that's where all the great bands were from. Uh, And my senior year, I never did pack a lunch. I just, I I pretty much ate whatever was at school. Um, And, and, but that was like, that was my fashion. You know, and then out of school, it was always um, new wavy T-shirts. And um, I was really into hip hop. I was like, I was like that one kid in the 1980s that was really into hip hop. Uh, Baggy blue jeans, Doc Martens, um, Swatch Watches again. Um, Yeah. So looking like a real dirtbag, I think is what I'm trying to get at here. And lots of, um, I played my daughter the dead milkman this weekend, um, bitch and Camaro. And I realized that when I, when I was playing that song, um, looking at, looking at it now, it is, it was 38 years old. So to my daughter, it's as old to her as songs that came out in 1948 were to me at the time. So at that time, songs that charted were like the Woody Woodpecker theme and the, 16th Avenue rag, you know, I mean, it, it is ancient to her, but to me, it was a kick-ass song and the dead Kennedys and stuff like that. Dirty rotten imbeciles and in the misfits and, you know, minor threat and suicidal tendencies. Like oh, those were, that was my music. And my daughter listens to it now and says, what was wrong with you? How many times did Mimi drop you on your head? Were you eating lead paint? And I listen to her music and I say, your music talks about nothing. Like how benign is your culture. So Doug, Global Trade This Week brought to you by our good friends at Cap Logistics. Our listeners and viewers want to know, did Doug Draper show up his senior year in like a poison t-shirt with acid wash jeans and Adidas high tops? Like, I want to know, what did you wear your senior year to high school? Mm. Gosh, you know, uh, believe it or not, I had more hair. Um, Oh, yeah. Oh, I believe it that. was, yeah, it was kind of floppy. I did have an earring. And um, when I went off to college, kind of the Judd Nelson look, well, let, okay. let me back up. Judd Nelson, the way he wore his hair, he had to kind of like flip it back. That was me, believe it or not. But um, wasn't preppy. I don't, I didn't really have a, a, a scene, really. I probably just followed the fashions. Um, a lot of Hawaiian shirts, if you can believe that. So, wow. yeah, Hawaiian shirts, Judd Nelson haircuts like uh, Breakfast Club. And, uh, and yeah, and Pete, this is not a setup. This, this is a Swatch Watch right here. Nice. And that's a piece of uh, masking tape that I've put on there because the little hooker thing uh, fell off. But this officially is a Swatch Watch. You can get them, 78 bucks or something. So uh, big fan. I wore a lot of swatches. Yeah. Yeah. For, for those of you who have not been around for a long time with Global Trade this week, Doug is an unabashed, unashamed hair metal fan, uh, metal fan, 80s metal fan, 70s metal fan, early 90s metal fan. And um, yeah. he's got them all. He's got them all. He's, uh, whether Crocus, Crew, Poison, Cinderella, all of it. So um, I was kind of half expecting him to tell me that he had like the king of all mullets. <laughs> or something like that, because he's a Kansas not, guy, but I didn't, I didn't get that. No, not quite. Well, this one's going to be a shocker to you, Pete, that um, I don't know if you knew this about me, but at the end of this uh, holiday weekend, there is a festival that uh, happens in uh, the Black Rock Desert outside of uh, Reno in Nevada. It's called Burning Man. And you will be surprised to know, Pete, <clears throat> that I actually attended Burning Man in 2017. Not a joke. 
not kidding, I went. And yeah, exactly. That was the expression I had. There's a, there's a couple of videos I'll throw on there. Best experience of my life. Let me say this, the burn was everything I needed it to be. Everything I wanted it to be. Plus, none of that. It was spiritual, physical, mental. It was everything. It was literally everything. And so here's the, so if you guys don't know, Burning Man annual event, it's in the Black Rock Desert. People around the world that kind of gather. In the beginning, there was the playa, an arid plain where no seed man or beast can find purchase. And forth from this land that God has forsaken, a city arises overnight with streets and public works and a five-star hotel, but no money. It's nine days, I just uh, held on for like three and a half days. Um, and they celebrate anti-consumerism and artistic self-expression and building a community and lots of art and things of that nature, but do not ever call it a festival and do never, uh, never compare it to Coachella uh, or you'll be, you'll, you'll be crushed. Um, and it has its own vernacular. So one of the things I learned there, Pete, MOOP, which stands for matter out of place, M-O-O-P, and that's essentially trash, right? But the fact that they called it uh, a completely different word gives you perspective. But my point in all this, the logistics of setting up that that um, that yeah. event, it is in a desert with nothing there. 75,000 people converge for a nine-day festival, and it is pretty safe, uh, pretty darn organized. There's medical facilities. Um, there's road infrastructure. There's trash removal. Um, they got to figure out where they're going to put all the art displays. There's an airfield there that uh, handles, I think, over 800 flights to bring stuff in, bring people wow. in, um, things of that nature. Uh, so it's like a perfect military logistics type of uh, uh, coming together. So <laughs> forget the event, right? I could talk to you for hours about the event. Um, partying in a 7... 47 fuselage in the middle of the desert. Anyway, I'm not going to go into crazy stories, but the logistics of the Burning Man, I'm going to find some videos and stuff that talk about it. Unbelievable. Being there and seeing the infrastructure that's set up and literally within weeks after it's over, you couldn't even tell it was there. 75,000 people come in and come out. So my whole halftime is Burning Man logistics. Very impressive. And I'll find some links so uh, our viewers can uh, take a look. I feel a field trip coming on, Doug. I do. And it's I pretty, tell you what, man, you're, it's yeah. peeling an onion with you. If I think if, if people watching the show said who went to Burning Man, they would have thought Keenan. Yeah. And then me and then you. They never would have thought you. Yeah. So I, I don't think I've ever been prouder, frankly. Thank you. I'm so, it's, I'm so excited. It is pretty, I think all told, and you don't spend any cash there, right? There's no vending machines for popsicles and stuff like that. But, um, I think I dropped like $4,000 um, between your ticket and the infrastructure. We had to rent a, rent an RV. You got to bring all your booze and your food, um, plane ticket. You got to get the burner bus to go out to the, to the event. It's not cheap. I mean, if you think you're going to roll in there with a backpack and drop 50 bucks and party for a week, you're not going to do that. It, it's a pretty expensive engagement. Yeah, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm seeing a, a field trip. I wanted us to all go to Anarchapulco together. I wanted you and Keenan and I to go down to the anarchist um, anarchist convention in Acapulco. But this may be better, maybe, because yeah. I have a feeling there'd be a lot more mushrooms involved. So yeah, <laughs> we could probably yeah. check that yeah. out. So that's halftime by our good uh, brought to you by our good friends at Cap Logistics. Uh, for those of you who are looking for a great freight forwarder, logistics provider, transportation provider, please do learn more at caplogistics.com. They're the ones that make all this available to the thousands of you who watch this buffoonery every week while we play Nostradamus and talk about what happens in the logistics world. And then take a break at halftime to say whatever foolhardy stuff is on our mind. So with that, Doug, um, why don't you give us your second, second topic? Yeah, this one will be kind of short because it's another um, example of uh, my initial topic, which was talk about big companies owning the rails and moving forward. And this made a lot of attention over the weekend because I thought about this last Friday. Um, and this is Amazon getting into the fray of true 3PL services, Amazon warehouse and distribution. 
AWD has to have an acronym. Um, and I think it parlays a little bit with the fact that they've overdeveloped their warehousing network. Everybody's heard about that. Talked about how they've put the put the kibosh on uh, construction and, and delayed openings and things of that nature. So there's, we talk about the warehouse capacity is almost non-existent um, outside of the Amazon world, inside the Amazon world, uh, there is quite a bit of space. And so they've jumped into the, the pure 3PL services. Now there's always been FBA, which is fulfillment by Amazon, which is really from my experience designed around smaller um, high volume type of uh, uh, type of fulfillment in e-commerce. Now they're getting into, you know, wholesale distribution, um, delivery, reverse logistics, um, throwing cases, if you will, and not just going direct to consumer. So um, I think the trend uh, to owning the rails is just another example of what's going on. Um, but again, the big boys are only going to get involved with this. I think competition is good. Um, the thing about Amazon is that one of their benefits is they're incredibly automated in their facilities. And when you circuit into a pure 3PL model, automation doesn't work for a variety of clients. They have to be very specific and unique with size, shape, weight to have uh, automation kick in and really be beneficial. That's why FBA was successful. I just want it in a small box. Um, so we'll see. I mean, they are the behemoth. And um, could it be a game changer? I don't know if it's a game changer. It will certainly be interesting to watch. But uh, when I read that over the weekend, I'm like, another big guy is starting to own and ride, or excuse me, own the rails. We'll see how this one plays out. Yeah, you know, I happen to know a thing or two about e-commerce companies getting involved in this kind of stuff. And my opinion about this is it's one of those things where I liken it to being a Red Sox fan, Doug, for someone like you and I. And you just keep watching the Yankees get, you know, just kick your ass. It, it, it's, I, I want to sit here and be like, oh, Amazon, you know, you're going to, nah, a couple of years from now, you're going to be like, nah, they're just kicking our ass. And here's why. The rails, the infrastructure, what Amazon will eventually do is at the point of origin, they will create consolidations that fit perfectly into their automation scheme. So that at the point of origin, they are managing the consolidation of the container so that when it gets to destination, they deconsolidate, they break bulk it, right? So that they deconsolidate it so that it is easily deconsolidated by their robotics and automation to go into their warehouses. Mm -hmm. So then when it's pick packed for final mile, it's easily pick packed for final mile to go into their trailers through automation. It's just, they're just lengthening their supply chain and they have the money to invest in it. The rest of us don't. I mean, the rest of us are flush with cash right now because of what's just happened. But most people are socking that away for a rainy day because we know that the suck is coming and we, we want to have that there for when it happens. These guys are like, mm -mm. nope, it's time to build that farm, farm league. It's time to build that farm team. It's time to go out there and pick up that first round guy and put him in our A-ball team that's going to just be a crusher by the time he's 25 and everybody else is going to wish they had Aaron Judd. We've got him. They mm -hmm. are just going to continue to become this omnipotent world crusher while the rest of us wonder how they got there. And this is how you do it. You continue to invest in the stuff that wish the rest of us are like, rah, rah, rah. it's not going to work. I'm like watch us. <laughs> we will continue to refine it and make it better over the next 24 months while you all sit here and tell us how much we suck because we have the money to do it. Our owner is making rockets because he's bored. So it's just the way it's going to be. And, um, I, for yeah. one, I'm here for it. I'm here for the drama. I thoroughly enjoy watching it because when they're done, we'll just take what we've learned from them and try to do it as well. You know, this is an industry that, that tends to, um, imitate innovation when it becomes financially more consistent for the rest of us to do it. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I love the take about, you know, they, their whole model is around the destination. Once it's in the warehouse and on ground, yeah. they've mastered that. What about origin? Exactly what you just said. They're going to get into the fray of forwarding um, stuffing boxes overseas and stuff like that. So I love that take on it. Cause I think you're spot on. And it's just, All I, right, brother. It, it, 
at some point, when do we just get tired of getting our asses whipped? I mean, that's what it feels like. They're just, mm -hmm. every time I turn around, Amazon is just stomping our heads with something else. Anyway, fi final, final topic, um, goes along with commerce. It's something that I have been noticing more and more, and that's the lack of cash in this society. And it was, um, it was certainly hastened, made quicker by the pandemic. Um, I realized the other day that I have not made a transaction with cash except for throwing my money in the, in my envelope for church in the past three weeks. Mm. Haven't bought a soda. I haven't paid for gas. I mean, I haven't done anything in cash. Most of my bills are automated. Um, I don't write checks. I use, you know, I did, so I got a new phone recently. I had to switch over all my mobile payments. Um, cash. Cash is one of those things where it was common for me, at least, to walk around with, with, with a good, you know, chunk of cash because I didn't want to have to worry about going someplace and them not taking credit cards or going someplace and the machine not working or going someplace and not being able to buy something or, and with all the traveling I've done, Doug, the number of times that a crisp $100 bill has got me out of a horrific problem would probably not surprise you, but it would surprise our listeners and our viewers. Um, and that led me to believe, you know, think about it. What happens if the infrastructure for that fails? You were just away this weekend in the middle of nowhere. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if you needed something, do they take credit cards, right? Like it, it, it's common for, for people to be in the middle of nowhere. I'm going away to Europe pretty soon. Um, I'm not even worried about changing dollars to euros. I probably won't even do it. I'll just, I'll just use cards and mobile payments. But when we, when we make that jump, that leap, it puts a lot of responsibility onto the infrastructure. And that responsibility worries me because I am such a chicken little when it comes to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And if someone were to break that infrastructure, if somebody were to just break a part of that infrastructure so that transactions couldn't happen because they were able to snap, snap transactional payments by hacking them, malware, whatever the case may be, it would have a devastating effect on our economy. And that got me to thinking about where there's a problem, there's a market. So is it only a matter of time before we have insurance products specifically for companies to back up the fact that, you know, they weren't able to do transactions because of cybersecurity. So, you know, cause right now cybersecurity doesn't necessarily cover that AO nominee by name inside the policy. So does that change things as consumers? What do we do when we're unable to get to that? Um, could you imagine what happens if, if the major credit card processors break down on a day and everybody rushes ATMs to get cash? Uh, I, I'm, I always go to the worst case scenario, Doug, but as we move to a less and less cash transactional society, I think we're beginning to forget what happens if the infrastructure could be broken or hacked or, or you know, somehow compromised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the insurance piece is interesting take on it, you know, insure against the, the failure of the, of the machine. So, uh, yeah, I think old guys like you and I walking out the door, I try to use cash as much as possible. And some of it's a joke and some of it's not, but this, I don't want people to know where I am. When we went up to Wyoming this weekend for Labor Day, Nothing but cash. Part of it is because not a lot of people took cards up there. But um, that's me. But my, I think I told you the story once. I was going to give my son um, some money. I can't remember what the deal was. And it wasn't that much. I literally had a $20 bill in my hand. He was five feet away from me. He's like, no, nah, I don't want it. Just Venmo me the money. I'm like, it's cash right here. It's right in front of you. You don't want it. He's like, no, nah, just Venmo. It's easier. And that is the key comment. It's easier. And the, the other thing that baffles me is when you do pay with cash, the shock of people trying to make change on um, cash, 
is just mind boggling to me. We're literally, here's how you really jack them up. It's like, you know, $20 and, and whatever, 43 cents. And you give them like 20, 50. And for them to concept, they mean in a younger generation to figure out how much money they're supposed to give back. It's just comical. You just tell them, here's what I need back. So I don't know. I, I agree that it's going to be a cashless society. The younger generation is going to continue to drive it. But old stodgers like me, I'm, I'm still a cash guy. I think I have a whopping $11 in my wallet right now, which doesn't <laughs> jive with what I just said. <laughs> but, but anyway, it's an interesting thing. The insurance piece is really interesting to me. Uh, I think you're spot on. Where, where there is a situation to insure, um, an opportunity to make money on insurance, it will happen. Yeah. Well, Keenan's just sitting there screaming, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, as we talk about this. I can hear him. I can hear him already. When we sign off, he's exactly going to do that. Yeah. He's going to talk about it. Screaming Bitcoin. Yeah. That's great. Well, Peter, I think that's it. Um, we're going to wrap this one up. Another edition of Global Trade this week. Pete's on the uh, East Coast. I'm uh, inner mountain region. Pete, we can talk about that. It's a big term we use out here. And um, mm -hmm. even though we're on the coast, Keenan makes it all happen in Cap Logistics. So visit caplogistics.com. And um, we will visit you next week. We'll have more great topics. Always the forward lean. Troy loves that aspect of our show. And uh, I want to thank you guys for watching. So until next time, Pete, have a good one, my friend. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. All right. Take care. Bye.